Thank you for joining us today. Just a few very quick reminders before we get started. All of the attendees are muted. If you are using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP White and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Olivier Califf. And thank you for your time. And I will turn it over to Olivier. Olivier, take it away. Thanks, Kristen. Say hello to all of you, virtual attendees. So I'm Olivier Calef, and I'll be moderating this session today. I'm a first liaison, and I was part of the 2020 Program Committee Conference. Uh, the Q&A will be at the end of the talk, so feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom browser. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm happy to introduce uh, Nicholas Liu, who is working at the AF CERT, which is the US Air Force C CERT. Uh, he oversees day-to-day -day cybersecurity operations and defense uh, for the uh, Air Force Internal Information Network. Mr. Liu, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you, sir, appreciate it. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, Can, is my screen all good? Yes, it is. Okay, cool. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. As the um, gentleman mentioned, my name is Nicholas Liu. I'm currently the Assistant Director of Operations at the United States Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team based out of San Antonio, Texas. I've been here for about three years, um, having started as a Tier 1 analyst, moving to being in charge of the Incident Response Section, um, to seeing overseeing current operations, and then where I am now as the Assistant Ops Director. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I apologize for the garbage truck that you might hear in the background. Um, official disclaimer, these are my personal opinions as you see on the screen. So the theme of this year's first conference is where defenders share. What drew me to wanna to present my unit's experiences on this topic was the massive problem sets and our subsequent growth and solutions in this area over the last couple of years. So we at the Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team are the enterprise level SOC for the United States Air Force. Like other SOCs for large organizations, working at the enterprise level means the responsibility and coverage of terrain is immense. Um, I would describe the responsibilities that we have at the AFCERT um, as being a mix of both being tactical, so doing the triage incident response analysis, that sort of thing, um, as well as being having that coordinating function. So working with a lot of other sub-organizations um, to conduct that incident response across the enterprise. Um, so over my last couple of years of, in my time at the AFCERT, uh, cooperating with other defenders is an immensely important topic, um, given that our organizational environment is a, is a very um, difficult challenge. So similar to other or enterprise organizations, um, working at scale on one of the world's largest networks um, with large number of endpoints and customers presents its own unique challenges. So for us, we have about 750,000 endpoints, um, about a million users, and a large number of networks. Um, and across all that entire network architecture, um, you have a diversity of operating systems, policies, protocols, et cetera. Um, standardization is very difficult. I'm sure that's, that's pretty common amongst national level um, CSERs at this point. Um, that's not the end of our trouble. So with this next slide, I'll walk through a little bit of the Air Force's organizational architecture for cybersecurity. It's really complex, um, again, because of the size of our network. So starting with how the Air Force is structured, so starting the left-hand side, you have major commands. So think US Air Forces in the Pacific, US Air Forces in Europe, US Air Force Global Strike Command. The major command can have thousands of people across dozens of bases. Um, these major commands at all these bases have multiple wings, just a unit, a type of unit, um, a group, a squadron underneath them. Um, and there's a diversity of purposes in all these units. So some squadrons, um, they'll support flying missions. Some will be just be your local finance office to make sure people get paid. Um, some are just support for research and development for weapon systems. So of course, that means you have a massive IT need and therefore a massive cybersecurity need to protect everything. Um, going back to how the asset is both a tactical and coordinating SOC, um, I couldn't draw all the organizations here on this one slide because then it would look like a huge spider web. Um, you see here, there's this huge number of organizations um, to support everything. Um, some of these have different functions. Um, some are just your regular IT folk at a base who don't have like a background in cybersecurity. Um, others are nascent cybersecurity units specifically to defend airplanes and their uh, underlying IT infrastructure. Others are just coordinating centers. Um, so you have a diversity of, of organizations um, in this space for us. 
So as, as shown on the last slide, you know, there's diversity of responsibility and authority for cybersecurity. Um, you have siloed organizations that only have their small piece of the pie. Uh, from what I've seen, um, you know, you have each organization is not only have a different network architecture that they're supporting, they're going to have different maturity levels. So whether like their training, they have different training pipelines for how they do cybersecurity. Um, they'll have different capabilities. If you talk about tactics, techniques, and procedures, um, people have different playbooks for that, um, different toolkits. Some people will use different, um, they, they, they conduct their cybersecurity in different ways. Um, responsibility, again, some are like, like us at the enterprise where we are persistent, we conduct persistent cybersecurity 24-7. Um, some are only temporary um, whenever they move around to different locations. Um, and and as a result, you have different reporting mechanisms. So based on the leadership, so for instance, um, at a local Air Force base, um, the wing commander right there might have different reporting requirements uh, for his local cybersecurity unit than us, for instance. Um, so what, what I've really seen from that is it creates an organizational culture like across the Air Force where everyone really has their small piece of the pie um, and really focuses on what they want to do. Um, therefore, they don't necessarily want to cooperate with other people just because they don't know what the possibilities of that are. Um, and as a result, you know, kind of with how the, the military is tr traditionally structured and wanting to take orders from higher up and execute those orders at a lower level, um, you have an organizational culture that becomes risk adverse um, and wanting to get after defending your network. So I added this last point, the culture of relying on higher headquarters for decisions, because that's really what we're trying to solve here um, by talking about a military framework that can adjust to, to this scale and this problem set. So now that we've kind of talked about how, you know, the United States Air Force at a large scale at cybersecurity enterprise faces these problem sets, um, this is what we're up against. So the adversary, if you look at the CrowdStrike Global Threat Report for 2019, um, they talk about these breakout times. So breakout time, um, is, it is the time it takes for an intruder to get into the network and then move laterally once. Um, you see up there um, with Russia being 18 minutes and 49 seconds, that is an immensely fast, that, that is an incredibly fast time um, given how long it takes to coordinate, conduct incident response actions um, if everything's not automated. So given that, you know, and knowing kind of the background of how we as an organization have to function when everyone is in their silos, how do we address this problem? It's a, it's a huge problem set for what we're working with. Um, I like to liken that to the idea of a wicked problem. So it's a problem that's difficult and impossible to solve um, because of the scale, um, contradictory knowledge, contradictory orders, different organizations working and not necessarily rowing in the same direction. I mean, how well interconnected they are. So that, that bottom line there you see with hundreds of cybersecurity organizations that have differing and unknown maturity levels. Sometimes you might not really know uh, priorities, responsibilities, relationships, um, that coordination synchronization at the enterprise level against an adversary that is increasingly fast becomes a wicked problem in, in my mind. So how do we solve this, right? Luckily, um, being from the US military, um, the issue of organizing, training, equipping, and executing military operations at scale is not something fundamentally new to the military. So regardless of the domain, think about um, not just the United States Air Force, but um, your nation's respective military, how they're gonna coordinate your land forces, your sea forces, your uh, space forces, your cyber forces, um, all together to create combined effects. So, or think combined operations. So allied nations that work together, they also have this problem of scale, regardless of the domain. So they'll have to figure out how to coordinate other land forces, their air forces, et cetera. Um, so that manifests itself in this idea of something in the military called command and control, um, defined as the exercise of authority and direction by a properly designated commander over assigned and attached forces in the accomplishment of a mission. It's not command and control in the, in the botnet sense, um, that's not what we're talking about here, but it, it is sort of related, right? So you have to be able to move around your forces um, in an effective way to get after this problem instead of how fast the adversary moves in cyber. So as, as for command and control, um, there are a couple of different uh, models out there. So when you break down the idea of command and control um, in your head, think about it in two, two, along sort of two different lines. Um, so you have your, your planning piece of it and then your execution piece of it. So the planning piece of it or the intent um, that can be centralized or decentralized. So for your intent piece, if you have a centralized intent, um, what that means is you're all getting on the same page um, all together and planning about what you wanna do. Um, if it's decentralized, you don't have that plan. Everyone is kind of doing their own little thing. For the execution piece of it, a centralized um, execution means that anytime you want to make a decision to affect something, you have to go through higher headquarters um, for them to approve that decision. Um, you can kind of see how that in, in, in working that, you know, for cybersecurity, um, that takes time. And again, and again, working with our current problem set of how fast our adversaries move, that's not necessarily acceptable. You can also have a decentralized execution where everyone will kind of execute 
um, along whatever the intent, how, however the intent was originally formed. Um, so I would say for us in the Air Force right now, um, sometimes it's a mix between um, centralized intent and centralized execution, um, where everything is directly planned specifically, you know, you need to look at this specific IP address. Um, and then centralized execution where whenever I need to work with another unit, I have to go upward to go downward. That takes time. Um, sometimes it's the other end where it's decentralized intent and decentralized execution, where not everyone is necessarily on the same page. And when they execute, um, they're, they're just working um, whatever they see fit. So really the model that I have kind of, in my mind, seen to work more successfully is this idea of mission command. That's the command and control model. Um, so going back to that intent and execution piece, that is centralized intent. So everyone getting on the same page together and then decentralized execution, um, being able to work laterally within the teams, not having to go up and then downward um, in order to accomplish the mission. The inspiration for this came from reading a book um, by General Stanley McChrystal. He was, the, um, he was the commander in Afghanistan and also the commander of Joint Special Operations Command. His book, Team of Teams, New Rules of Engagement for a Complex World. So what the premise of that book um, talked about how being able to work with different intelligence agencies, um, different military organizations under this mission command framework um, where they weren't waiting for higher leadership to execute um, because of how fast um, they needed to react in, in terms of their mission in Afghanistan and special operations. Um, being able to, to have that centralized intent and that decentralized execution um, was a way to get after that, that time issue. Um, this has all this has this idea of mission command has its roots um, in the industrial area. So when Prussian mili military generals um, started scaling up their armies upward and they needed to be able to move forces um, all around the continent, um, but they couldn't wait on trying to make a decision, wait, wait for like um, their, their messages to be transmitted across each other. Um, this was the model that they came up with to execute and be successful at what they did. So I'm thinking that if you know, this model has been successful in the past. How can we apply this to the enterprise SOC um, where we're commanding and controlling hundreds of different cybersecurity organizations? How do we get this on the same page? So a little bit uh, more in depth about what mission command is. These are the key tenets. So building cohesive teams through mutual trust. Uh, General McChrystal, um, he, he manifests this in the idea of liaison officers, so LNOs. Um, so sending your people down to other people's units um, and vice versa to really get a sense of what each unit does. Um, that helps bridge the information gap as far as what I know versus what you know and how can we come together. Creating shared consciousness and shared understanding. Um, again, it's not just technology. I'm not gonna touch too much on technology here, but um, having the idea to know what other organizations are thinking, what their TTPs are, even just um, coming from the same training pipeline. So for instance, um, US Special Forces um, for specific units, they'll all train together. Um, that way they can really understand how they all operate together um, and what they're thinking at the time to be able to react to things. So it's creating that shared understanding and shared consciousness. The third one, uh, providing clear commander's intent. Again, with mission command comes centralized execution. Your outcomes have to be very well defined and understood, understood amongst all your team of teams. Exercise discipline initiative. This speaks more to being able to take action as you see fit um, without having to wait for approval for things. So what the military calls fog and friction or essentially not having complete information or communication at all times. Um, exercising discipline initiative means making risk informed decisions without waiting, higher, without waiting for higher guidance from leadership. Um, because again, the problem set of how we face and how fast the adversary, adversary moves, we have to make a decision at some point. Um, the fifth point, mission orders, that's more specific to the military, um, but essentially what it means is whoever's in charge and how you're gonna do that centralized um, intent you define the outcome, but you don't necessarily define how to get there. You leave that for the teams to figure out. So that way um, other issues can be focused upon. Last one, accepting prudent risk. Um, that's, that's mostly self-explanatory um, since that's our business of really managing risk as cybersecurity professionals. So from the after, I'm gonna highlight two vignettes that emphasize mission command. Um, the first one dealt with trying to figure out what enterprise hunt looked like. It started off in the summer of 2018, utilizing organic AFSERT manpower to find an advanced persistent threat. Um, the outcomes of this hunt revealed that we needed to start collaborating with other mission partners rather than just working internally or inorganically with our own manpower. Um, that led to a reattack in the fall where we worked with a singular mission partner, a local SOC um, at another base to find an advanced persistent threat. Again, that also that, that sort of pilot showed that we needed to scale upward and work with a lot of other mission partners that are out there. So whether or not it's the, the NOC, 
um, deployable threat hunters, um, more local socks. Um, this, this cycle of experimentation carried onward into the winter of 2019 or 2018 and early 2019 um, with a specific task force that we made to conduct an enterprise hunt on the Air Operations Center um, at Scott Air Force Base. So that supports um, a lot of the air mobility operations. So think of the planes that refuel other planes, um, planes that carry a lot of uh, cargo. Um, that's, the, that's the area we were looking for. So what does mission command really mean um, when we're talking about this specific task force, right? So we had a few deliberate phases. So the first one was deliberate planning. Um, you see there the list of mission partners that we had. So we had local security operations centers, deployable threat hunt teams, um, and an organization specifically devoted threat intelligence, us as the enterprise SOC, um, your NOC, and then the owners of the actual air operations center network. Um, so we actually flew everyone out here um, to San Antonio to come meet us and took the critical step of defining roles and responsibilities for each member. Um, that manifested itself in a document called the Information Exchange Requirements, um, figuring out each team's capabilities, what they brought to the fight, as well as um, what we needed from everybody else. So if I'm the enterprise SOC, I don't necessarily know um, some of the very intimate details of that local environment that that local SOC is gonna know. Um, that can help inform me in my decision as, as I push forward with preparation of the environment, which I'll talk to in the next slide. Um, secondly, the establishment of mission command as the appropriate command and control model. So when you bring a bunch of organizations together, you need to identify, hey, how are you gonna communicate? What is the framework for doing this? So for us, this was us trying mission command. Um, being able to work laterally with each team member without having to go, up, go upward and go downward, um, and that which would take time. Um, this was pretty revolutionary for us in the sense that for the first time we had all the relevant players to construct, conduct a full-scale cybersecurity um, at multiple levels. So not just the, the local level, but the enterprise level. So what does this look like when we're actually doing preparation in the environment? So um, once we established everyone's information exchange requirements, answers began flowing back and forth um, without having to push it to the task force commander, um, which, you know, again, going up and down and um, having to get approval for a lot of things is the current, is how the Air Force mostly current um, does it. And that's, that takes time, right? Um, so as an enterprise SOC, what this meant is getting a better understanding of the specific air operations center network and coordination with a, with a NOC um, and the local SOC for a better data logging strategy. Again, relying on that SOC's, that local SOC's intimate knowledge of the environment. Um, you know, how many systems they had, um, what sort of people work there, what sort of software is supposed to be implemented, et cetera. Um, for coordination with the threat intelligence organization, what that meant is creating hunt packages. So passing a lot of that information on what's on that local network um, to the threat intelligence organization to define vulnerability scans and uh, create hunt packages for what we're gonna look for. Um, the third point there, training of threat intelligence analysts alongside threat hunters to build trust. Um, we actually got some of the threat intelligence analysts from the threat intelligence organization and had them train um, with our team for a couple of months actually. So them being able to understand um, how we operate, how we, how we, um, what our TTPs are, um, how they're gonna get on mission. Um, that goes back to General McChrystal's point of building cohesive teams through mutual trust. So that, that played a huge part in the extra, actual execution of it. A big point here that I wanna note as, as tasks uh, popped up um, for our teams, we operated independently in the, in the fact that we coordinated with the other teams directly um, and then just um, just gave the task force commander an aware, awareness just for SA. Um, but we didn't have to go to approval for this because at that point on the ground, we are the ones that are the experts and are able to talk to it more quickly and make a decision rather than having to go through the task force commander. So that saved us a lot of time. So as for the actual execution of the speeds, um, the highlights of mission command from our perspective were um, being able to be better integrate intelligence, threat intelligence um, into our operations. So having the threat intelligence analysts um, sit directly next to us, um, whenever an operator found something that they thought might be suspicious, they could pass that to the threat intelligence analysts who have um, access to the greater intelligence community um, to conduct requests for information and better contextualize what they found. The second, the second piece, and um, in my mind, uh, the biggest takeaway from that is that enterprise to local SOC coordination, um, being able to validate what we saw at the enterprise level as suspicious activity. Um, again, because that local SOC knew that intimate knowledge of their environment, they knew who was supposed to be there, they knew what sort of software was supposed to be there, what they were supposed to be using. Um, they, they knew if any past events had happened that um, may have contributed to what we saw as suspicious that day. I would say for us as the enterprise level, again, having to work with, hundreds of different organizations, um, that local SOC coordination significantly lowered our response time to validate suspicious activity. 
And again, whenever we executed, um, this was all done directly with the teams. This wasn't necessarily having to go through the task force commander, which again, saved us time. So the second vignette that I'll talk about, um, it wasn't a planned hunt. It was more of an incident response um, at the time, um, but we, we did utilize some of the lessons learned from mission command um, with the first vignette to apply to this second issue. So um, some, a, few, a few months later, some of our organic sensors detected suspicious activity that revealed the system was compromised. Um, but by using that kind of concept of mission command, uh, reaching out to different organizations, getting on the same page, conducting centralized planning um, to figure out how everyone is going to be executing in the future, determining mission command as your command and control framework, um, we were able to reach out to local SOCs to track down the devices and perform um, investigative, investigative and remediation actions. Um, using that same model, again, working at that speed, that was really critical. Um, working with in intelligence organizations to reach back to the intelligence community to find the greater contextual evidence um, for what else to look for, that was very, very critical. So I, I think to that piece, um, for this specific example, understanding the clear commander's intent is probably the biggest thing um, because the system was a critical system that was important for the Air Force. Uh, we all were on the same page with that. Um, I would like to note here that one of the local SOCs, um, kind of when I mentioned maturity levels, this was a nascent cybersecurity unit. Um, they didn't have a lot of technical training and we're not up to par as far as where they were, but nonetheless, they're still able to help out. Again, being that local SOC, having that intimate knowledge of the environment um, really helped us at the enterprise level solve our problem. So as, as far as the limits of mission command go, um, I, I will say mission command as a command and control framework for how you organize your, your units requires a lot of work up front in terms of getting everyone on the same page with the ideas of centralized intent and exercising a disciplined initiative. Um, these are probably of the those five tenants to master. Um, these are the most difficult since it requires affecting the multitude of organizations that fall under your enterprise. Um, I know this presentation didn't address too much of the technology piece of it. You know, when we're talking about um, shared consciousness, shared understanding, technology can definitely help with that um, by being able to spread information more quickly. Um, but it's still, you still have to, regardless of whatever technology you use, you'll still have to influence the people on the teams. Um, there was a good talk yesterday by um, the people from multiple ISACs in the United States that talked about how they were using, I think MISP was the platform to share um, IOCs. However, even if that platform does exist, a lot of organizations were not necessarily sharing information. So just because they, they didn't necessarily want to again. So you still have to influence uh, the people in that regard. As far as where the Air Force is going with this model, um, it's to some degree baked into our organizational procedures. Um, there are some current efforts to consolidate different organizations. That way you have less total organizations that have to participate. Um, which would help when you're trying to work at scale. Either way, um, at the truly enterprise level, uh, at our level, we're having um, thousands of endpoints um, and hundreds of different organizations. Standardization across material level, technologies, terrain, um, as the adversary gets faster, will, will not necessarily help. Um, but I think having a, a good model for how you operate um, that's not constrictive, um, but isn't too loose either, um, will, that, that can accept this sort of fog and friction, um, will best maximize the defense of your network from an organizational perspective. So with that, um, that's my presentation. I'll, I'm open to any questions at this point. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, we have two questions. The first one is, do you have any thoughts on uh, SOC overlap with other branches in the DOD? Yeah, so I know, um, at least for the Air Force, um, I would say that that concept of mission command and working with other organizations in the DOD, um, that's a bit stovepiped right now. Um, usually we have to work through higher headquarters for the Air Force um, before we work through uh, with other services at this point. Um, there, there are some efforts to unify that, um, but those are still in the works, I would say. Okay. Another question, what potential problems do you see with uh, utilizing mission command as a framework uh, to conduct cybersecurity operations? that other command and control models uh, would sufficiently address. Right, so with, with mission command, um, you're, you're under the assumption that everyone's on the same page. So besides the work you have to put up front um, in terms of getting on the same page and executing, uh, there is a lot of information that will come through in mission command. So the task force, the person in charge of everything, the task force commander, um, they're gonna have a lot of information overload. Um, I think the model of having centralized intent and centralized execution um, where information really only flows um, upward and downward, that can be helpful um, with that. However, you have the issue of um, 
of, of speed, right? So if you can better consolidate the organizations that you have um, under you um, to have less a less number of organizations, that can help. So with that model with centralized intent and centralized execution can help. Okay. Another question, you mentioned uh, a little bit uh, training. Uh, while doing training or exercises, do you try to overload uh, the various stakeholders with a huge amount of, uh, of information to see how it works, how the model works? I'm sorry, would you mind repeating the question? I didn't understand. I, I mean, you, you spoke a little bit about training and, and exercises. So during the, these exercises, do you uh, uh, pour in a lot of information and, uh, and um, I don't know, uh, even to the, to the teams to see how it works? And are you trying to push the model to the limits? Yeah, so with, with this, these exercises, they're, they're, like you said, there's a lot of information going on. And as far as pushing the model to its limits, I, I definitely think um, we need to take an approach where we're addressing a lot of these organizations as a whole. Uh, again, getting everyone in the Air Force, those hundreds of different organizations on the same page. Um, I think the Air Force, there, there are some current efforts to really expand that outward. Um, to a lot of the cybersecurity organizations out there, but it's still pretty nascent, I would say. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we no longer have any questions. So uh, um, let me thank you uh, for um, this presentation. Uh, this was of great interest. And uh, thank you to all of you virtual attendees, uh, especially for those who ask questions. Uh, we now have a break, so uh, let's uh, we convene together uh, around, uh, well, in something like 30 minutes. Thank you, Nicholas. Goodbye. Thank you all.